record and welcome everyone uh this this i i wanted to actually cover most of chapter four but it's a huge chapter in terms of ideas and, and way too much squeezed in here um which is and i myself had to you know remember and 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 make sure i understood some of it so we're not going to cover do all of it but um and good thing that both nico and kartika here to jump in in case i get anything mixed up but i thought even though steve does a, a little bit of background i thought it would be better to like root things uh more directly in neural data initially so i'm front loading with non grossbergian stuff that people will recognize as as familiar neuroscience because once you see what steve does with it it can seem like well, what subject are we talking about again uh so that's the the plan for today and yeah karthik nico uh just jump in if you want any to make any comments i've got put a lot of slides in here but i have no i'm not committed to to covering everything but uh but, but I'll, yes in just a sec i will tell you what my plan is so last week we talked about the the yin yang of boundaries and surfaces and we we used the art and the illusions to develop some kind of intuition about why we should think this way uh, and that itself is is a lot to to kind of wrap one's head around um but uh and they're all right at the mo at the moment these are just suggestive ideas but we need to dive dive in actually and there's a, a whole lot to flesh out about everything on this because all everything that sounds like a vague statement actually has some mathematical grounding and in addition and the reason it's complicated to understand is that it's not just a mathematical grounding but a conceptual grounding so there's multiple things happening in in the reasoning behind a lot of this that that is a little hard to keep track of sometimes so i like to think that all the way up until now what we collect uh, as experimentalists um uh and any and, and even sometimes the theoreticians do is little fragments we have these pieces and we say well this area does this thing and or this brain type this cell type does this or um such and such area lights up we have all these and none of that is wrong uh, the, uh well some of it is wrong but but when they're well replicated we still don't know what to make of it so we we have some sort of ideas about which pieces are involved in this larger puzzle which we might as well call the perception action loop um but we don't know how to put them together and what's frustrating when you attend talks a lot of the time is you'll present really really interesting data like just fascinating genius level like um experimental design very clever analysis great diagrams and like steve <laughs> sometimes but um but then you ask at the end of the talk there's like well how about speculating about what it means in the larger scheme of of how you do you have a pet theory about how the brain works and often the answer is no uh, okay i often fi find myself asking a question which i thought surely everybody has asked this person this question and then i get a sort of like well not really so steve is at the opposite extreme because he has thought about a whole lot of how to piece things together and also suggest puzzle pieces that people haven't discovered yet and then sometimes they do go on to discover them or at least that's what he claims so i'd like to review very quickly the the circuit of early vision a lot of you are most of you are neuro people so you've seen a, a good chunk of this but it's good to just sort of tear through um the basic circuitry um and then i'm going to talk about a few historical points in early vision um electrophysiology uh and then we'll focus on one little part of of one of steve's key models the fcs the feature contour system and uh, if we if we manage to reach there we'll talk a little bit about hierarchical resolution of uncertainty but at this point in the chapter and in the model things get a little complicated and i don't know whether we'll actually make it there so we can either talk about this next week or come back to it later because as steve says wait till chapter 10 wait till chapter 11 there's a lot of that stuff happening so so we can wait to <laughs> um okay so let's just sort of trace the pathway of signals from the retina the um, you have two visual fields and in signals light from both sides of your visual field go to both eyes and then uh there's this very interesting for uh process where signals from the same visual fields 
get split up and pulled together again. Um, so the, 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 the right visual field of both eyes will end up going to the left um, visual cortex and vice versa. Or we're good to keep in mind. And this whole crossing business, no one really understands why it evolved, what, what the purpose is. Um, because uh, so that's always uh, a tricky topic. Uh, well, do you, you remember if this crossing uh, visual field thing goes all the way back to core dates, or is it like in fish as well? Do you remember? I don't know, Nico, Catholic. What, what, what repeat the question, please? Does the decussation the visual, the left yeah, hemisphere yeah. deals with the right well, space? Is that true? And early goes back to uh, the, so the er earliest. Um, organism that I know of, and this is citing Eric Schwartz, is that has anything like foveation as the goldfish. Um, and the goldfish definitely has contralateral representations. We might actually know this just from the Chisek things. He might have actually said it. <laughs> and so I have to go, I can just go back to that. Uh, and again, here's the, the structure of the eye. The light comes in through here. There's the, the lens here. Um, and you have this sort of strange structure on the surface, uh, which I'll show in just a sec. Uh, and you have the optic nerve uh, going through and that's where the blind spot is. So here's a beautiful drawing of uh, the retina uh, where the, the light comes in. Apparently, um, so there's different types of cells. I guess you should be able to identify the famous cells by, by just how they look. Like the little a is rods, this b is a cone. Uh, then you have the retinal ganglion cells, where this next one has all the, the more schematic, more modern diagram. Uh, and I remember, apparently when Richard Feynman heard that the the light sensitive cells are on the inside. <laughs> He's like, I didn't want to have anything more to do with neuroscience, apparently. So this doesn't make any sense. Well, it works. I'm not sure that's true well. for cephalopods. I think cephalopods have the other way, like cuttlefish oh, really? and squid. Yeah. So they don't have a blind spot at all because of that. So, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah. Quirk of some early choice in evolution led to this inside out kind of uh, uh, structure. I mean, we can always come up with an answer, uh, adaptation answer, right? It's not, it need not necessarily just be a quirk. Uh, you can always say that the rods and cones need to be protected. So we don't have, uh, for example, if you look at it from the point of like a stem cell niche, uh, you don't have a, a replacement of over, you know, burnt sensor in the visual cortex, unlike say the olfactory system. So it is also like partially protective of that system. I mean, I'm, it's just so story, but you can all, also come up with some answer like that, uh, that, you know, the rods and cones will not, uh, are, are not going to be replaced. So you better have some protections for them when they are like subject to very uh, uh, varying magnitudes of uh, intensity of light and so on. So, yeah. I, I would just like to point out furthering that comment that you know if you look at if you look at the role of radiation in dry macular degeneration, which is you know cumulative process, um, I don't think you would have the, the fact that we can see for so long um, at a high level of acuity is due to the fact is in part due to the fact that the, the most sensitive radiation detectors that we have are protected from hard radiation. And yet, apparently human beings can detect single photons at above chance levels. It's unconscious. They don't know that they're seeing anything, but they, when they guess, they guess pretty well. They guess very well. I mean, we can get into the, the sequence learning aspect of this later on, of course. Oh, interesting, okay. Um, this, this is just the, the response of the the, the cones and the rods. Everyone should be fairly familiar with that. And this just shows where the distribution of, of these uh, cells is. So you have a whole lot of cones around the fovea. Rods are distributed fairly evenly. And you have that blind spot, which we talked about last time. So when things, uh, when signals leave 
the, the retina, where do they go? First stop is the lateral geniculate, geniculate nucleus, GN. This GIF is a little low res, but I like these 3D things that they have on Wikipedia because uh, uh, the fact that they rotate actually helps you kind of get a sense of the, the shape of it. But so the, um, so the, the thalamus uh, has the uh, various sectors and the LGN is a relatively small sector at the back, right next to the medial geniculate body. Uh, and so that's the sort of, people call it a relay uh, and then people get irritated that, that it's called a relay and then they say, well, it does some processing, but uh, I don't think anyone has a good functional story of why it's not just a relay, although we know some things about what it does. Well, 90% of the synapses are top-down synapses into the LGN. Exactly. Um, so and, here's another... Just and there is another rule of thumb that you can use. Uh, like you use for uh, visual field, the, the thalamus is the size. Uh, the, the the LGN and the thalamus is the size of uh, the your finger, uh, your, your your the nail of your thumb. So that's like a rough rule of thumb for a human being as to what the size of your thalamus is. So uh, that's another rule of thumb. So the thalamus has this uh, structure. Um, it, it, uh, sorry, the LGN has this layered structure. Um, the, this, this is a, I believe, a coronal slice, uh, and this the the way that the uh, the signals from different eyes reach is, is this interesting sandwich of ipsy and contralateral uh, input, uh, and then it, and there's two types of cells: the parvocellular and magnocellular, uh, coming uh, that originate here and then get send the signals to V1. So this is. So, so, so my understanding, having having actually, so I did an orbital dissection where um, I also there were a whole bunch of leftover brains that I got a chance to uh, dissect. Um, is that the layered structure is not oriented? So the the LGN is is sort of like a set of Russian dolls. Um, in the sense that the um, the inner the inner part of it, you know, is it's it is like um, not a disc but like a half sphere, and then they're layered on top of that. So whether you cut it, you know, horizontally or coronally, it, it looks sort of the same. It's more like an onion. Okay, yeah. Because whenever yeah, I see these diagrams, onion. it doesn't have you know the 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 brain compass points, dorsal, ventral, medial, lateral, etc. Anterior, posterior. Uh, so from there, uh, axons Just, go to uh, V1, one, as we pointed. One side note, mm -hmm. uh, in the previous slide, the superior colliculus is also always ignored, but very yes. important, especially in birds. And it, it actually bypasses the LGN, goes straight mm -hmm. from the optic nerve. You're going to get there? I'm very glad you mentioned it. I forgot to put a slide, slide on, on here, because Steve doesn't talk about it, and ma many treatments don't talk about it. But I, uh, more and more, I'm thinking that if we take seriously some of the implications of things that even Steve talks about, like the fact that you need to move in order to see and that seeing is fairly active, uh, we have to take seriously uh, a superior colliculus. And there are analogous findings for the inferior colliculus and hearing. So I don't have anything to, to specifically to present about that, but yes, we have to uh, keep in mind that this, this nice, neat kind of trajectory so is missing out some things. So the in in this chapter with the facade BCS FCS you won't see this but once you get to art scan you will you will see that uh, okay. he, might, he might not talk about it in terms of superior colliculus but you will you will see that that information is very important. So it, so, it, it, so it, I would I would just also would like to point out with regard to the optic track uh, uh, crossing um, the brain that uh, one of the most evolutionarily conserved functions um, in not just the mammalian brain, but in all of life is circadian rhythms. And that where the optic chiasm crosses is right where the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which controls circadian rhythms in mammals is. And um, if you think about circadian rhythms you know, as something that has to do a low pass temporal filter. So a cloudy day doesn't make you think it's fall or a sunny day doesn't make you think it's spring. 
in animals that live for multiple seasons. The integration of information um, at the same point from both the eyes, and there are plenty of animals that don't, you know, blink simultaneously, and you know, dolphins, for example. Um, because it becomes a very important evolutionarily conserved source of information to the circadian rhythm system that it's getting information from both eyes and the and the suprachiasmatic nucleus has a special class of ganglion cells called IPRDCs. that uniquely project to it and do not go through the LGN or anything else. Hmm. Cool. Yeah, so there's definitely subtleties. So all of these things have to be understood as approximations um, and incomplete pictures. So here's the primary visual cortex, which uh, as many people know, since there's more feedback going to the LGN than coming from it. But as Eric Schwartz likes to say, well, there's also way more cells in V1. So if you do the math of that, you will tend to see more axons going one way than the other. So that's uh, in, in Broadman's map. In fact, this is Corbini and Broadman's map uh, from 1905, uh, colored. And it's right at the, this is phrase I like. It's the visual cortex, primary visual cortex is uh, along the banks of the calcarine fissure. It's a very geographical way of describing it. I always like that phrase, banks of the calcarine fissure. So there it is in yellow uh, on the two surfaces, lateral on top, medial on the bottom. And it won't be super important now, but it's nice to kind of keep track of the, the way that the visual field described geometrically, basically, maps onto things, because this is the primary way that people understand receptive field, which we'll get to in a sec. So these, the word Q here stands for, for uh, quadrant. So that's how these things map. Uh, and these, this Myers loop and optic radiations, I, and I wasn't super familiar with, but they're basically two, Fiber tracts, right? Uh, yes. Okay. But we don't need to talk about that too much. And then we won't talk much about what happens beyond V1 and V uh, and maybe V2 and V3 right now. But um, there's a whole hierarchy, um, and many people will share the um, Fellman and Van Essen's di diagram, or Fellman and Yo's diagram. Now this is based on the same data, but my collaborators, I'm just shamelessly plugging, uh, they said that well. That hierarchy is not based on any particular principle, which Fellman and Venison themselves admit. Uh, and in fact, Klaus Hilgetag did a paper earlier than this that said that there are hundreds or thousands of different hierarchies that you could uh, propose uh, using just their criteria. So this criterion going from out to in, which I've talked about before, is based on the anatomical hierarchy, which is that the, the more uh, U laminate or well laminated areas are, are on the outside, and on the inside are the, the limbic, the ones that have a weaker or a less clear laminar structure. I'm just throwing that out there. But basically the idea is that there's a whole lot happening that's much harder to uh, tell a, a, a linear narrative about once you reach V1, even though it isn't a linear narrative in it at LGN either. I, I um, would just like to comment, and this is me, this is not anything from Steve, that when we think about graphs like this, we should think about the idea of post sets. <laughs> nice. Okay, <laughs> that 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 requires a while. To uh, uh, something it'll take a while to expand on, but but yes, I agree. Um, so uh, while I was reading the Hubel and Weasel stuff, I, I I was I decided to just go back a little bit, and as you guys know, I really like the history of neuroscience, and it always seems like people um, will pick a few famous names and then you know, that the, the other giants on whom some people are standing don't get named that often. Um, it's almost as if uh, people think that everything started in 1945 or 1950, um, uh, which is simply not the case. Uh, so the concept of receptive field, uh, which becomes very problematic as we go higher and higher or deeper and deeper in, in the heterarchy, is very useful to, to start with. And, and it has a, the phrase at the very least has a specific uh, publication that you can cite. Where did the concept come from? Um, Halden Keffer Hartline came up with this concept while studying uh, various reptile uh, retinas. Mutt puppies, rabbits, 
mud puppies, I mean, rabbits, all that. Yeah. So, so here it is. The first time you'll see this phrase, most likely, is um, so no description of the optic responses in single fibers would be complete without description of the region of the retina, which must be illuminated in order to obtain a response in any given fiber. This region will be termed the receptive field of the fiber. Now, even though it's um, uh, defined here in terms of the retina, what you in practice do is talk about the visual field, like outside, the, like the relative position um, of the source of the light uh, with respect to a stationary retina. It's a little point that is good to always keep in mind. So right from this early early work, work which itself is not the first work, I haven't done a th thorough job of tracking down the entire history of electrophysiology um, of, of the visual system. So even here, right from the get-go, you see that there are interesting patterns of on and off cells. So some cells will respond positively to the presence of light, uh, or uh, and some will will prefer light to go off. And, that, and even at, the, at at this stage, you can see, um, I think in A, it's a bundle from the turtle's eye showing one fiber giving on and off bursts. So I think this one, the it go it it releases a burst when the light turns off. And then I think there's another one. I think they superimposed a few different. And so this one likes the onset, but then continues to file. So you see a bunch of different cell, cell types. Some of this one seems to file, the B seems to file in the middle, uh, a little bit after the onset. So, so this on and off uh, pattern has been observed uh, for quite a while in, in the retina. Uh, so there's some important conclusions here. Uh, so if we're talking about receptive fields as a general concept, I mean, that goes back to Fetchner. Ah, so he probably called it something else. Fields, just, I was tracking. I mean, fact, receptive okay. fields as an idea does go back to Fetchner. Right, right. Yeah, I'm sure, and I'm sure someone else came up with it in some other article somewhere and might even go back to the Arabs if not, uh, if not earlier. But that's where the phrase and the definition came from. Even Halazan did not have the idea of receptive fields. I haven't looked at it. But um, so yeah, the, the off responses are weak or absent following short periods of illumination. Similarly, on responses require sufficiently long preceding periods of darkness for their, for their full development. So there's some temporal in the context that you have to keep in mind. The discharge in fibers giving only an off response is promptly suppressed by re-illumination. So that's a, a kind of indirect pointing to inhibition. Um, the type of response to any given fiber does not depend on conditions of stimulation or adaptation of the eye. This is quite an interesting point. Um, even certain external agents, um, while affecting the, res the responses, do not alter their essential character. So basically, what they respond to doesn't change with all these various sorts of changes. Again, good to know. Um, experiments on fish, amphibian and reptilian eyes give essentially the same results. Um, okay, the receptive field we already mentioned and the location on the retina of the receptive field of a fiber is fixed. Its extent depends on the size and intensity of the spot of light used to explore it and upon the state of adaptation of the eye. So, what it can respond to is bigger than what it does respond to and, and how much of it it does respond to will depend on those factors. Um, so already in, uh, so uh, Stephen Kufler was, I think the first to look at um, the cat retina. And, and he, I, I think um, Hubel and Weasel were at the post students or postdocs in his post lab. Under him, so. Postdocs in his lab. Um, and uh, so here you see um, a concept that will become really, really crucial, um, this on-center, off-surround or off-periphery kind of structure. Now that, that phrase that Mark had asked earlier about the origin of these, some of these terms. So the, Steve didn't come up with these terms, they, the, these vision researchers did. Uh, they didn't use lateral inhibition because they were primarily talking about the firing pattern and were not sure what the anatomical basis of that was. So that may be one of the reasons they didn't call it lateral inhibition. But what you can see here is fairly self-evident from, from the picture. So once they had identified, identified what broadly a cell would respond to in terms of spots of light 
onsets or offsets. They could look within those regions for how they responded. So in this case, you see that kind of onset and then offset kind of in regions A, C, and D, and uh, B kind of responds tonically. It's not exactly a perfect onset or offset on, but they did see a lot of those kinds of cells too. So, so heartline, uh, it's actually the case that Heartline did talk about it in terms of uh, uh, lateral inhibition. Oh, we did. Uh, I didn't read yeah. the whole paper. So uh, that was like the major, uh, the, the limulus retina, that's the one for which they won the Nobel Prize. They actually had that model. Uh, in fact, Steve would later show that all of them can be subsumed by the RCF-like system. So right. He says it in, in one of the earlier chapters. So I think it's the Heartline Ratliff. Rat 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 yeah. I, I don't remember exactly the name. So uh, th th in that case, in that paper, they do talk about it in terms of lateral inhibition as a mechanism. Right. I think human and weasel and, and even Kufler, I think, are a little bit more careful to say, well, we don't know exactly how it's happening. It's an effective onset or off uh, And here's a picture of that sort of thing. Um, the, they're looking at different, uh, how it responds to this, the diagonal shading is the off surround and there's an on center and then there's an intermediate region which is they call on off. And uh, I'm not gonna show any diagrams, but L the LGN also has center surround. So you get both on center, off surround and off center on surround responding in LGN. So they're basically the inverse of each other. So this is you know well-known experimentally. Um, then we can move to the great Hubel and Weasel uh, recording for the first time, I believe, in in uh, in a vertebrate V1, and uh, so here they 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 look they they basically take forward Kufler's um, research program. Um, they show by shining small spots of light on the light adapted cat retina. Kufler showed the on center and off periphery. Um, this on and off areas within a receptive field were found to be mutually antagonistic. And a spot restricted to the center of the field was more effective than one covering the whole receptive field. Very, very useful to keep that kind of thing in mind. That, that if, if you don't have that, one of those YouTube videos of Hoople and Wiesel lined up, we are I having a vote of no confidence on I, the moderator. I completely forgot. I wanted to send it out because they're a little bit long and I didn't want to embed them. But I watched them myself. I'll send them after this. But, but I'll just yeah. try the YouTube link. No. <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the, yeah, I completely forgot to do that. Uh, but I could. Do you want to watch? How many of you have seen it already? Some of you have already seen it. But but yeah, just watch it later. It's it's they basically discovered what they what I'm about to show by accident. Um, so so yeah, so they should point out that a moving spot of light often produced stronger responses than a stationary one, and sometimes the moving spot gave more activation for one direction than for the opposite. But spots is actually not the the main kind of take story. So, but we'll start with that. So they they took little spots of light and. Uh, to read this, basically the lines show the, the period during which they're moving a spot across the receptive field and how the cell responds. And here, this is a receptive field, which has got this oblong, I think off center, on surround, is that what you see? So one of the two, on center, off surround, or the reverse. Um, and so in many units, the rate of maintained activity was too slow or irregular to demonstrate inhibition during illumination, and only an off discharge was seen. It was, however, always possible to demonstrate inhibitory effects if the firing rate was first increased by stimulation of excitatory regions. Um, then when excitatory inhibitory reason, regions were stimulated simultaneously, they interacted in a mutually anta antagonistic way. Uh, so that's good to know. Um, but most interesting was that, and this is what they discovered um, more or less accidentally, uh, and which is explained in, in these videos that are, are, are on YouTube, that they were placing spots on slides uh, and they weren't really thinking about orientation selectivity when they were, and they were getting not very response, not very strong responses from these V1 cells they were recording from. 
And as they were changing the slide, uh, they got a strong response. And it took them a while to actually figure out that it wasn't anything about the spot. It was the edge of the slide itself that was producing the strong response. Uh, so, so that was one of those great moments. I've, I've, shared, I've shared a one minute video of, uh, the, in, the, in the chat. It's just one minute. It's pretty sweet where, where they actually show that like how they got it like all accidentally. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah, and, and basically they're just playing the sounds through a speaker so you can hear the little um, and uh, you, some, no fancy stats needed because you can hear the correlation with the stimulus uh, directly. Um, and, and they weren't just sensitive to an orientation, the movement mattered. Sometimes it was sensitive to moving in one direction and the other. And sometimes you had um, cells that preferred when the orientation was, was in a particular direction of movement. I, I just want to say for anybody who hasn't done electrophysiology, that the first time you stick a single extracellular electrode into oh. a brain and you start hearing the pulses, and we still do it to this day, is it's one awesome. of the most thrilling things you can it's possibly awesome. experience. It's awesome. That, that pop crisp popcorn sound is so fantastic. I can't like explain how like you feel when you do it. It's just awesome. So yeah, the so so there are cells in V1 that in fact most of the cells in V1 are not particularly interested in spots of light and definitely not stationary spots of light. They much prefer oriented um, contrast patterns, basically. Um, and because Steve likes to make a distinction between edges and oriented contrast patterns, which doesn't have a great name, but but uh, let's not call them edges. There is there is still an ongoing debate in the field. Mm -hmm. Whether what we call as orientation tuning is just orientation tuning, or is, is it motion that is also like captured partially by that? Do we have to wait till MT for pure motion to be detected based on direction alone? So right. it's it's still it's like it's like the same idea with respect to receptive field. It's like a back and forth idea. It depends on how you want to interpret the data. It's sort of like uh, yeah, orientation is fine, but at the level of the receptive fields or the sizes of the neurons in V1. The motion doesn't fully matter, or you know, people have gone back and forth. It's like it's like a it's a big debate just in that uh, realm of like electrophysiology as to like whether there are true uh, or orientation detectors or are they motion uh, detectors of edges or and the likes. So even going back to the first two photon stuff, the, the, like the Oki paper, um, you know, which which did or or the reverse correlation stuff. This sorry, the reverse correlation stuff is the Oki paper. Um, in 2001, uh, where they showed that V1 receptor fields were dynamic in time. Disentangling. You're talking about Ozawa, not Oki. Oki is. Oh, sorry, Ozawa, not Oki. Yes, you're right. Sorry. Um, the uh, Ozawa paper, you know, using first order statistical techniques, um, discerning a temporally um, varying field uh, from from a from the stimulus point of view is is almost impossible to do and I Karthik you can correct me but I don't think anybody's ever really gotten a, oh. <laughs> a convincing explanation a convincing experiment that bifurcates the two ideas no uh, but I think I saw a paper recently but and uh, not the question you are asking no so all these things are more complicated than anyone uh, can fully can you describe, but it does seem as though motion per se is needed for most of these cells. Very few of them like a stationary um, uh, orientation pattern. Some of them will maybe respond a little. Well, if we're doing Yarvis, we'll get into well, yeah, the stationary yeah. background in <laughs> yeah, quite yeah. some detail. I will get to that. I, I, I started looking at his book, man. Uh, so, so some conclusions from here. Moving a light stimulus in the visual field was generally an effective way of activating units. So moving per se is important. Whether the speed is important beyond the threshold is, is something I don't know that much about. You guys can comment. Um, the, a number of units responded well to some, some directions of movement, but not at all to the reverse direction. This will be important. Um, <laughs> and some of those cells could be activated just as well from either eye. So we see this binocular cooperation, but not for all of them. So already we're seeing some kind of multiplexing of inputs 
to, uh, to produce these different sorts of responses. Uh, and uh, if afferent fibers are excluded, no units so far recorded in the cortex have had fields with the concentric configuration so typical of retinal ganglion cells. So those on-center or off-center on pattern, not, not at all. At least they didn't find any uh, with that, uh, that kind of symmetry. Now, just to step back, we're not really going to focus on this. Uh, uh, or, uh, we just, but if you were to look at the topological relationship between the visual field and positions on, uh, on, on V1, what would you see? Uh, people have known for a while that there's, there's, there's non-uniform magnification. So the fovea is very strongly represented and it falls off. And uh, one of the former CNS uh, uh, professors who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, Eric Schwartz, uh, he provided a, a pretty nice, elegant uh, mathematical explanation for how this uh, transformation happens. So if you represent the position of a point in the visual uh, field, again, visual field, not retina, <laughs> um, using a complex number, uh, then when you look on in V1 and say, well, where in V1 is the, the two cells like that particular location? And we say, when we say like, we mean any orientation. And what basically will happen, which is a little hard to keep in mind, keep in mind all the time, is that a location in V1 will have cells that respond to all orientations at that location. Um, among, and there may be even slightly stranger things, but a, a little patch of V1 will be dedicated to some corresponding region of the visual field. And that is what is functionally known as a hyperpolyp. Yes, that is the definition of a hypercolumn. And in this case, to you, the the single unit that you see in the cortical hemisphere, whatever that square patch, squarey looking patch is, that is the, but that is where a hypercolumn is. So that's that's the definition of a, a functional hypercolumn. Yeah. So a fun fact about the log a, a logarithmic map like this is that it's a conformal map. It does not preserve distances, but it preserves angles and has some very interesting invariance properties, which have only been used partially, if at all, in, in, in sort of tech applications, as far as I know. Um, so uh, if, if on the left, you have the visual field, and on the, on the right, you have what's happening in V1, rotations uh, in the visual field correspond to translations in V1 of, of, of activity. And scaling, uh, 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 is moving laterally. So up and down versus left and right capture large um, and very important types of invariance. But we'll, we'll come back to that later because it's not mentioned much in what follows. So in uh, V1 and, and also V2, right? There, there are di different types of cells and, and Hubel and Weasel gave them uh, simple names. Uh, simple cells um, have an orientation preference, but don't really care with what the direction is in which you present the, the contrast pattern. Uh, so that's A uh, and, and B, roughly. So you could have uh, cells that have an off on both sides, or you could have asymmetrical ones that have an off on one side and no on on the other. Um, and no off on the, on the opposite side. And then you have cells that, that really prefer a certain direction uh, of motion. Those are called complex cells. And then you have hypercomplex, which <laughs> all cells that exceed complex cells in intricacy of behavior. Um, and one example um, is end, end stopped cells, cells that don't just like a particular orientation, but also prefer it to be of a particular length. And if you exceed that length, they, they fire less, which is what this is showing. The arrow is the direction at which you're sweeping the stimulus across the field. And then, so as you increase it, 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 it uh, the cell likes that less and less. So it's as if it wants the a, a particular length and basically ending in the receptive field is uh, one of the ways to describe it. So they often call end stop cell. So, so uh, if you, there's some Marge Livingston and uh, uh, I mean, so I, I don't know, we're just talking about electrophysics. So Marge Livingston has done a lot of work and then Arash Yasdan Bakshu, who was my advisor, but also worked with her, has actually done a lot of work on these end stop cells. So uh, the, in, a, in, a, 
in a quirky way, we can say that the in-stop cells give us a, an idea about the limit of a receptive field because it defines length via the uh, the firing rate itself. So we will be able to kind of define how far a neuron is able to see something in the visual field. So it's it's kind of, they've, they've done a lot of work based on that. So it's a very important uh, research work that has been carried forward after Hibben and Wiesel too. And Marge Livingston, uh, who's at Harvard Med School, has done a lot of work on that. So now we come to Steve. Um, what did he do? So this is how I like to just summarize his strategy. Take what you do know about the visual system and maybe potentially add some hypothetical cells which no one has yet discovered um, and combine them with the principles that we've started talking about, competition and cooperation, certain maybe higher order design principles, all um, expressed in the language of differential equations in order to explain illusions, psychophysics experiments, um, expand what you're interested in so to things like 3D vision and binocular vision, uh, and at least gesture towards why all this is, is useful in a, in a more realistic environment. This latter part, maybe people may not be very satisfied with, with what is in the explanations, because uh, a lot of focus is given to illusions, but um, partly because of computational complexity and just the pain of setting up simulations that involve a whole lot of stuff. Um, uh, Steve doesn't necessarily get into how exactly this would work for an animal moving in a very, very complicated environment, but the principles are motivated by those kinds of challenges. Um, so another thing I thought I could, I could do, which Steve uh, does not necessarily always spell out, is, uh, so there's a, the word phenomenology means two things. Um, when physicists use it, it means just, uh, well, we're going to model something at the level of the measurables like say temperature and pressure, how do they vary with each other? Uh, so the gas laws are phenomenological models. They're not making any particular claim about uh, how or any of this happens. It's just that this is what happens. And this can be quite powerful, um, like even like the, the, the most accurate models of superconductivity start, started as phenomenological models. The other uh, word way to use phenomenology is the older uh, way, which is, um, kind of philosophical uh, uh, field that, that is interested in analyzing the nature of experience, but not in a subjective psychological sense, um, if that makes any sense. So I like to think that what Grossberg does is a bit of both. On the one hand, he's trying to explain observables in terms of each other. And on the other hand, he's trying to talk about the phenomenology of subjective experience, but the objective part of subjective experience, if that makes sense to you. Um, so uh, we have our straw man version of a sensory receptor. And what, what does uh, Grossberg do conceptually and with the model? He's saying that there's a kind of prism effect happening where this raw pattern of light is split into boundaries on the one hand and features on the other. And there are specific parts of the brain that do this. Um, and they interact with each other. So in order to achieve these, this split, um, they need to interact with each other. So that, that's why he, he said early on, these are not modules. They're not doing things in ignorance of what is happening elsewhere in the brain. And this uh, is an important feature of these kinds of models that unlike a lot of boxologies where they say, well, this brain area is telling this brain area to do this, which are often very anthropomorphic models. Here we're talking about boxes that interact and the interactions are shown with differential equations. Uh, and the argument is that they're reasonably plausible so that if you wanted to make a spiking version of that, it wouldn't be too difficult apart from just finding the parameters. Um, so having, so, when, so the brain is doing this splitting analysis of the energy pattern that's uh, impinging on it. And then it, it creates inside it uh, a representation which is a collection of, of useful information. They're not yet representations in the sense of words or symbols or anything like that. Um, and where he gets with this chapter, but we, where I don't think I'll be able to actually get there, and I didn't put any slides to it, is that you split something into uh, a knowledge of depth order, so where things are, where they're uh, so not just what is the outline of this 
in, in, a, in a simple sense, but what is the order of multiple objects that may be stacked one in front of the other? Uh, and why do that? Because that will be useful in categorization, planning, and action. So the reason that all this seemingly complicated stuff is going on is that parts of these, the split of the pattern will be directed towards things like, like we saw with the, the what versus where pathway in the case of the where, of, of the where or the how pathway. It, it's as a first approximation, we can say that knowing the outlines of objects and wh what their 3D depth order is, is more or less what you need when you're chasing after something or reaching, reaching for it, uh, assuming it's not a poisonous mushroom or something like that. But the actual reaching and grasping, as opposed to identification and subtle aspects of, of uh, understanding what it is, um, can be done using just the outlines, for instance. And so, you split, split these things up because it's the split up pieces that actually separately can contribute to, to various sorts of behavior. This latter, this, the latter half of the diagram is often kind of missed out because of the complexity of this, the early part, because it seems like as if he's talking about the Cartesian theater on one level, but uh, uh, I don't think that's really the, the right way to read it. Although he does talk about the isomorphism between some neural pattern and a subjective experience. So uh, the other thing that I'd like to add is, is the final figure. That's a very nice cartoon that you have with the depth bar near and all that stuff. Uh, you can also add additional like dimensions to it by like talking about it in terms of color or brightness and all that stuff, right? So, so the whole main major phenomenological point of, 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 of the surface feature idea that is that you only perceive surfaces, right? So the claim that Steve makes is you only perceive surfaces and boundaries are required to form these surfaces. We'll get into that with PCS, FCS. But the most important aspect about the perceptual aspect is that all these different uh, representations, I'm, I'm using it very loosely here, all these different representations all constitute the, the perceptual phenomena that you're observing. So it's the nearer depth one, the far depth one, the colored one, the bright one, the whatever. So all of them together, it's that multiplexed version. That is the perceptual reference that uh, representation that you uh, that you perceive. So that's a very important thing to keep in mind. Right. Uh, I um, wanted to, or actually, I'm glad Karthik mentioned the word representation here, since I wanted to, I, I don't know if we, have, we ever want to discuss this, but just mention this as a sort of orthogonal point, which is J.J. Gibson and the ambient <laughs> optic. Please, no, no. Uh, actually, uh, Steve, Steve's work um, avoids a lot of internal representations um, effectively and deliberately. I mean, he read Gibson seriously. Uh, and, you know, I, the, the idea that our brain is going to take the energy to maintain an internal representation when you can resample in a reasonably stable environment. You know, I think it, uh, you know, I you know, I'm obviously not a direct perceptionist, um, but you know, the, the the idea of what, especially an active perception, that we go and resample, which is also an energetic activity, but I think a less energetic activity than, you know, having your parietal cortex wired up to you know max uh, metabolism, trying to remember seven things at the same time. You know, it's it's the, the idea of resampling is very important. And the idea that when there is uncertainty, you go back to the primary sensory environment if you can, is also really important. Um, yeah, these are this is a very important point that, uh, and and I think that uh, I I have been fighting against anti-representation lists for a while just because I I think the term is hard not to use. But I think the the the, the key Gibsonian point that the brain may not necessarily be doing all the things that you think it's doing in terms of creating a little mini world inside you. Um, I think that's well taken. And, uh, and, and that, so they, the Gibsonians often use the term information pickup. Um, I think it's weird because it suggests that information is sitting there for you to pick up. So, but if you insist on using that type of terminology, I would say that what Grossberg is doing is showing you how pickup works, <laughs> how the pickup of information uh, make uh, is uh, how the information that gets picked up gets accessible to your hands and your feet and 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 all all of the rest of it. So let's 
Yeah, I mean, never-ending uh, argument. I mean, of which is another way of saying that that something like farging theory cannot explain behavior under the Gibsonian, uh, you know, uh, postulates. I mean, in terms of direct representation, the only thing I ever got Mike Michael Turvey to uh, appeal to his own authority on is circadian rhythms. But, <laughs> Yeah. That was uh, after yeah. five hours of argument in his bar in his basement. That's a different yeah, I've, I've encountered a few anti-representationalists in on Twitter and in person, and it's a very odd conversation generally. So anyway, <laughs> but no, um, but no, but I think they they have a real point. Yeah, yeah, I agree. When um, in naturalistic behavior, when you can, if you're in an environment when you can race resample, it's usually cheaper to resample than try to hold on to it as a memory. Right, right. But you know, imagination is a thing, you know. <laughs> so and so and stuff think. gets hidden sometimes. Right, right? Yeah, exactly. There you go. There you go. And when an object passes behind another object, you can't resample which, it. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's one of the nice things about the the 3d aspect of steve's um work which unfortunately i didn't really put into this because it because i thought just the features the 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 um, boundary contour stuff was complicated enough that I, so we can talk about the the feature part next week um, just just to to give uh johan some cover here uh so i did uh, a special interest group reading on facade which is the full deal um with enyo in session and it took, we were planning on going over three papers. It took us the entire semester to cover the 1987 papers. Yeah, so, and because I myself had forgotten about some of this stuff because I was like in first year of grad school taking a course in on vision of this sort. And uh, I think at that age also, you, you just think you understand things and then passes right through you. Uh, and the sort of person who's, I could like write exams and have correct answers without necessarily completely understanding what I was writing. I think that was the case. So I was, I, I feel like I've only understood it somewhat better than, than, than that level now in the past week. I, but, I, thought, I thought running the special interest group on facade was, was enough of an effort that I put it on my CV while applying <laughs> to postdoctoral positions. Nice. <laughs> so Steve uh, starts this chapter with um, this experiment uh, this result by Yarbus. But the figure in the book is actually not very nice and, and they're all low resolution pictures anyway. So I was like, let me find uh, what Yarbus showed everybody. So I look, looked at the book and it's a treat reading. I haven't finished reading it obviously, but it's a treat reading this. And, and the diagrams look cool, really, really cool. So what Yarbus was doing was stabilizing images on the retina. How he did this uh, is the whole story. I put a bunch of slides about how he did this at the end. So when we have, if we have time, we can talk about it. Um, Steve himself calls the method heroic. <laughs> they involve suction cups and really extraordinarily beautiful and crazy uh, things with lenses and little pieces of paper and, and tubes that, so that you can simultaneously have an image on the retina that's stabilized with respect to the little retinal movements, which are so crucial to, to perception. So you can simultaneously have stabilized images and not stabilized images. Um, so this, you can see behind the stuff that's being stabilized to like a piece of paper on the wall or something like that. And so in this particular experiment, um, the, the black and white circle in the middle is stabilized. So whatever the eye does, the, that image doesn't change with respect to the, to the retina. And the, the subjective percept which is what's explained, which is what is sort of schematized on the right, is that eventually the black and white stabilized um, set of um, contrasts disappears. And when you then introduce an, uh, an image, uh, an additional uh, a contour, like a uniformly shaded piece, which, it, which does move with respect to the eye, it uh, is visible and it, its color is uh, influenced by the invisible background. So uh, it's an extraordinary, it's just extraordinary result that, that this thing that you don't see has a effect. So it's an uh, you know, uh, unconscious uh, 
phenomenon, but um, it's a cause of of the shade. So so there's basically contrast, um, brightness contrast or color contrast is happening, where the the fact that there's a white background increases the contrast between the dark and and the red background, and on the other side because of the black it 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 kind of lightens it. So so Steve's idea is that this shows that there's a separation between the processing of boundaries and the processing of what to fill into those boundaries. And uh, it's, not, it's not only Steve who, who kind of thought that way, but, but he took, made a lot out of it. So we, we look, looked at this before. So, so Grossberg's explanation is that even though the contrasts are invisible, their polarity influences uh, filling in of the boundary. So the fact that they, they are different from each other is being processed somewhere in the visual field even though the, the, whatever that processing is, is not conscious. Um, Yarbus himself, although I haven't finished reading the book, often uh, seems to assume that all of the processing is happening in the retina itself. Uh, Steve obviously does not think that that is what's happening, that he thinks that uh, much more of the visual system is involved. So here's where we can make sense of this, uh, or at least this is a great way to remember what Steve means by the fact that surface filling in is sensitive to direction of contrast. So, and that these are independent processes that influence each other. Um, so I also thought that it, it's sort of interesting as a converse of neon color spreading uh, or sort of complementary kind of effect. So. Are you, are, do, do you have anything uh, from the, are you gonna go into the land stuff yes, at all? Yes, yes, yes. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing a little sort of fast forward version of NEO basically to the extent that I can. Um, uh, okay, so Probably separately, have we invited NEO to participate? Not yet, but but uh, maybe we should at some point. Um, so, uh, all right, what was I going to say? Okay, so. Uh, just bookmarking that for now. Steve will will have a story about that that effect in a moment. But this this effect um, in the book, there's two images right next to each other that kind of weaken the effect for me. So, how do you see this image? How would you describe a light panel on the right and a dark panel on the left? Okay, good. Um, that's what a lot of people see. Most people see. Um, but if I just take I've away that, it, I've seen it so many times that I can see the original thing very well. <laughs> so this is what happened. What is weird? So so this is the uh, image that's next to it, even in in the book, and and which Steve will simulate. Uh, Steve students or uh, postdoc will simulate. Um, and when I had both of these images in front of me, it weakened the effect of the Craig O'Brien Corn Suite illusion on the on the left side. Now I'm pretty sure Steve does not explain that. <laughs> um, so. I just I thought that was fun to point that out. That it was I, in fact I thought that the printing of the book was was like not very good. But then I covered the, the image on the right and I got back the effect very strongly. Uh, so it's, it's awesome. And this is why psychophysics is a whole lot of fun. Uh, I love this kind of thing. So anyway, there's a cusp of brightness. The, the ends of the two boxes actually have the same shade as you will no doubt notice if you just sort of futz around with your own screen. Uh, so there's a brightness cusp that goes up and down like that. Um, okay, so something interesting is happening and the boundary seems to be crucial to this effect. Um, now what uh, is the overall phenomenon or the more, maybe more ecologically uh, motivated uh, piece of information that we need to take into account here? It's discounting the illuminance. So there've been experiments where you can place uh, two different pa patches of color or contrast and then vary the overall illumination by many orders of magnitude. And you can compare, ask people to compare what they see in the center with uh, a reference patch, which isn't receiving the same change in illumination. Uh, it's a constant illumination. And there you see people always pick the same uh, uh, um, swatch as the match. So people are, discounting the illuminant. Um, and so to some extent, there's illumination invariant discrimination of a surface 
contrast and color patterns. We have to be careful here because we are not. We should not say that people are unaware of the illuminant because we are. We, we do know when overall illumination changes. It's so something subtler than that. It's that we are able to extract information about, for lack of a better term, we can call sameness of contrast and color. Um, we can factor out the illumination. So discounting does not mean being un unconscious of. Um, and so the brain suppresses many types of signals. So the actual raw pattern of contrast or color can be suppressed in order to extract the real color. But um, what is real in this context? I remember having answering on Quora, somebody asked, is our colors real? And I said, well, no, not really, they're in your head. So, so what does real mean here? Pigmentation? More or less, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, if you want to restore the notion of objective color, the way to do it is to say that things that have a particular pigmentation or just surface reflectance properties will tend to look away a certain way objectively when in white light to uh, observers with a certain set of uh, visual um, processes going on. I mean, it seems to me like the important thing is an invariance rule where like the same snake should be, should, it should be considered the same color on a longer time scale. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So, so doing that involves- well, so Welcome to Michael uses, Land land. Yeah, we're, we're almost there, we're almost there. Uh, <laughs> so, so Steve uses the term reflectance for the, the ratio of contrast or color to overall. But that's not a standard usage as far as I know. Could, could you uh, could, uh, tell me where this word reflectance originally came from, Karthik or Nico? Um, as far as I know, the first time he he used it was in his um, 1981 UMAP. UMAP paper, yeah, it's a UMAP paper. He just, I think he talks about reflectance in terms of the total energy, right? That's kind of how he... Yeah, it's, it's in terms of, it's a fraction of the total energy. Right. So what we're interested in is... The, the, the ratio which gives us a clue about pigment or what the actual surface is made of because that is invariant to changes in illumination. So we're not actually interested in the wavelength of light. We're interested in something else. Well, so as Michael Land is about to show, I assume that <laughs> in fact you can get Edwin Land, Edwin Land. identical photons hitting your eyes that you perceive as different colors. Edwin yeah. Land. So um, Steve uh, did not cook up any of his theories out of out of nothing. In the case of vision, it's strongly influenced by a lot of other stuff that's happening, um, and, and in particular, uh, uh, Ed, uh, Edwin Land's work with, um, with sorry, uh, Edwin Land, Why James, Edwin Land, Roland, and McCann. Those are the three people. So this is the guy who invented Polaroid photography, right? <laughs> Yes. So um, uh, in, if you are in Cambridge in Boston and Massachusetts, you'll know that there is something called as the Edwin H. Land Boulevard, which starts at Kendall Square and goes to like Leishmere North Station. Uh, so the Polaroid factories were here and the last of the Polaroid factories has now been destroyed. And that's where the new Ragon Institute is coming up right next to my current building. So uh, it's, a, it's a very important uh, achievement in the big industry that started the whole photo uh, well, so, so yeah, the, 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 they were not neuroscientists, but they were interested in how human vision works. And uh, they say something very clear and well written in this case. When we measure the amounts of light in the world around us, or when we create artificial worlds in the laboratory, we find that there is no predictable relationship between flux at various wavelengths and the color sensations associated with objects. So we believe the eye must have evolved a system which, through use of light as a communication medium with the world, has become as nearly independent of energy as is biophysically possible. That's great. That's just a perfect way to summarize what it is we're trying to say. We need to not rely on energy uh, as much as we can. In short, color sensation must be dependent on some as yet undefined characteristic of the field of view. Um, now, uh, so we're looking for a permanent or invariant characteristic of the field of view. It'll be a ratio, but there's some interesting subtleties to how to go about computing a ratio. So this is what they did. This is a, a review uh, retrospective um, by McCann about the Retinex algorithm. This is what they came up with from a, for a more kind of computer vision-y sort of perspective, but, but um, 
So they presented these patterns. They called them Mondrians after the paintings of Piet uh, Mondrian, who was, a, who was a Dutch painter, right? Um, and uh, so they had patches of, of various sorts of colors. And uh, they uh, showed people these pictures and asked them to, to identify the same colors. And they did psychophysics experiments and changed the illumination. They would have different kinds of uniform illumination or like gradually decreasing blue or increasing red light. Uh, and they found uh, this sort of invariance pattern in how people were able to recognize colors. They also, I'm just putting this out there because it's there, they also created 3D Mondrians. And here, the story is more complicated, as you might expect. They're not actually that great at, at discounting the illuminate perfectly or, or computing reflectance, the ratio. Um, so here, what, what does it say? It's in the caption. So in the 2D case, with various sorts of illumination, observers reported color constancy. They were in very large, uh, kinds of changes of illumination, including illumination color, um, they were able to say, well, this is yellow, this is red, or match it to a swatch typically. Um, in, 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 uh, mel in what, what's it? Uh, uniform illumination in 3D, they could mostly do that, but with sharp illumination, and there's lots of shadows, they were not so able to do it. I don't know whether Steve has thought about this stuff, probably has, but, not going to really look at this any further for now. It's just something to keep in mind. Um, okay. The word yeah. rational comes from ratio. Yes, Nico, you were about to say something. It said the answer to your question is yes, Steve. Yes, I'm out. sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, you know, ratio, the Pythagoreans knew what was, what was good. <laughs> they knew that ratios are cool. Um, so again, from that McCann paper, uh, there's a nice quote. This discourse is all about is about a generally unrecognized animal sense, the ratio making sense. That's great. Uh, it is the ratio making sense which processes the radiation reaching our eyes in such a way as to discover the constant properties of objects in relation to the radiation falling on them. But where, where do you compute the ratios? There's all kinds of places where you might want to pick uh, to compute ratios. And what the RetinX algorithm and Steve's more neurally inspired model does is tell you how to do this. Um, so yeah, how does the brain, and so this is the key kind of thing that Steve wants us to think about. How does the brain distinguish a change in reflectance, change in real color from a change in illumination? This is a problem, like you can't just compute because if there's varying illumination, then a difference in shade can always be confused with a difference in illumination unless you do something very smart, which is what these systems do. So you compute reflectance changes at contours and then fill in the illuminant discounted surface colors. This is the whole recipe, uh, which we've talked about before, boundaries and surfaces, but now motivated from this may maybe more um, ethologically and ecologically relevant way. Um, so in this case, if there's this constant gradient of blue, then if you know where to compute, which is on either side of a boundary, then you're doing a good job uh, of, of, of computing what the colors are. And then you use those compu new, newly computed values for a form of filling in, which again, we have to be careful. It relates to what we consciously see, but more to what we consciously know, because we always are aware of changes in illumination. Um, so here's his description in the book. To better understand how competition helps, let's think about so how does the brain know whether it is computing the ratio between positions on different color patches or on the same patch? This distinction must be made to avoid confusing the illuminant with an object's reflectance. To see why, suppose that a mountain is illuminated by a gradient of light, where the light is more intense at one side than the other. This will tend to happen when ever a single light source to illuminate a large object from one side. And that one of the earlier figures. Um, so if all the brain did was compute ratios between arbitrary pairs <laughs> uh, of spots in the, in the visual field, then it would compute the relative illuminant properties. This you should just work out on your own, <laughs> but, but it's um, uh, not the relative reflectances, which is just the opposite result from the one that's needed. So if you were to sample the visual system, 
then you would not get the answer that you wanted. Uh, uh, like the example of a bunch of ratios from various places. Um, okay. So contours tell you where to safely compute. I just would like to make, a, I, I think, an important point here. Good, good. Which is that this effect occurs even under free viewing. You do not have to have the subject fixating it, fixating any given location for this to occur. So this happens around the log polar map. It happens around the fact that, for example, at the fovea, we tend to, due to the density of the ganglion cells, have around a minus 0.2 log unit threshold for illumination. So this is happening around all of the other constraints of active perception. So this is, and that's not trivial it, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's very hard to even get to, to um, you know, get a situation where both this occurs and we mostly have an actual per, uh, perceptive system because our eyes moving around, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Yarbus is motion. I mean, our eyes create motion when they move. So, you, you know, this, this, is, this is a perceptive thing that is, is, I don't know ecologically why it would possibly occur, but you know, it's it's not it's not a trivial result of almost anything else in our early visual systems, or or our you know active or behavioral visual system. It's a very strange thing. So this diagram, in some ways, is kind of more uh, descriptive than a lot of the text for what the strategy is. Um, um, so, but we'll we'll show some simulations that make it a little easier to understand what's happening. Uh, can um, I ask a really, really quick question? Yes, um, I can you go back just one step to why sampling from random points in the visual field wouldn't work? I I, I feel like I just missed a, a little piece there. So so the 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 ratios uh, nearby will mm -hmm. will will not give you uh, the actual reflectance changes. So that what you will be computing is the change in, in illumination. Because so the so just think of it like as the light pattern. When the light oh, pattern oh, right, right, right. I see. So the, the issue is that the illumination isn't always even. It can be yes. irregular. Yes. And so to since the since the illumination pattern can be spatially interesting uniform. itself, you, you get the best information out of local things where the illumination is most likely to be uniform. Well, yeah, yes. it's exactly like the checkerboard with the shadow on the, the checkerboard is the same exact circumstance where we understand right, right, right. the way this exactly item in the shadow of that cylinder on the checkerboard that we have talked about last time. So, so John, uh, in this example, you might get away with a kind of a random sampling because it's always like a gradient in one direction. So you might be okay, but the fact is that's just a, uh, the, the, the illuminations can be from any arbitrary angle. So you can't simply uh, you know, uh, take any random sample and say that that's the right. That's why isn't, isn't, it seems like there's sort of a built-in prior that the illumination pattern is going to have a larger spatial characteristic than the thing that's being illuminated. What is the prior here? Uh, well, the, I mean, I could be looking here at an image that is basically just one color or one pigmentation under a very complex light source. Yes. That, yes, that's fair. That's, I think uh, that's fair. Yeah. Right. And, and so if I'm going to get any in information out of local contrast, it has to be the case that the illumination pattern is made of big blocks of light and that, that the, the, the thing that's being illuminated has smaller details. Although that's, that's yeah. not necessarily the case, because you can imagine a checkerboard uh, under you know, a tree has a really complicated illumination pattern. You can still tell it's a checkerboard. So I'm not sure how relevant that is well, to- so There you may have to actually add, add in things like recognition. So if I were to make some really weird object that you've never seen before- And then uh, put that place it in dappled, in dappled light in the <laughs> forest, would you actually see, see what you expect or, or anything clear? So that, that's, so, I mean, Steve's thought about that in, in the context of top-down yeah. expectations, but <laughs> yes. But the, this the, the, quite, quite... somewhat well-behaved illumina illumination is is crucial. But more important is that the boundaries are clear, uh, and and that there's enough information yes uh, locally to make the boundaries. So, so and that may be the case make... with 
with the illumination source as well. With, like, yeah. If it, so, if, yeah. So if you made like a malicious light source where you had illumination patterns that partly <laughs> lined up with, um, with contours of the boundaries of objects, but partly didn't, then you might yeah. be able to create really weird filling in properties um, because the features will be uh, from things that don't actually belong together. Yeah. But the light pattern is creating unusual uh, contours. Uh, right. That's, that seems like the safest prior to come in with is that the illumination pattern and the object being illuminated are independent okay, in, but, in yeah, terms okay. of their, and, their edges. And moving will actually help you a lot in this. Project. Right. Of course. Of course. Like, moving will help you a do ton. That, you know? <laughs> so, so yes, this right. is a good point though. It, it's, uh, it, it, it teases some of these ideas apart. Um, okay. So, so contours tell you where to safely compute ratios. Um, and so here, I think Steve is like not clear on whether he wants to say that what's computed is what we see or not, because we do see changes in illumination as I keep saying, but part of this process greatly distorts the pattern of retinal color from one perspective, because we're not actually having a, a, um, a, um, a met, met representation of actual light pattern. So we create instead this discrete skeletal um, representation of the color contours. Um, thus, it is not the case that every stage of brain processing yields increasingly accurate representations, not necessarily. And here, and this leads into this point he likes to make called, about hierarchical resolution of uncertainty. So the processing at one step might actually lead to problems that need to be dealt with later. So let's now kind of zoom in. And, and, and so now that we have the general idea of what features and, and uh, boundaries do, we can zoom in a little. So this is the BCS FCS system, boundary contour system, feature contour system. They're two interacting modules. And we can walk through the steps that are all motivated by findings um, in the visual system. Level one is the stimulus itself, level two, is the circular concentric on and off um, cells in LGN. Level three is the orientation direction of contrast sensitive units. So they like a particular direction at which light and dark are split. Level four is the orientation. Uh, so here's where um, you have the, the direction of contrast doesn't matter, meaning that whether it's light on one side, dark on the other, or dark on one side, light on the other, the cell is equally happy. Those are complex cells. And, well, one class of complex cells, sorry. Uh, then you have boundary contour units, which at the time had not been associated with cells, and I'm not sure we can talk about that. Um, and the diffusive filling in. So five and six, we, we probably won't have time to talk about, and I didn't put any slides on them. Because just talking about uh, how the boundaries get set up is is a, is um, it, there's a lot there, but the simulations really make it clear what's happening qualitatively. Fine. Yeah, yeah. Before we go go back to that slide because it's very useful. I mm -hmm. remember that at the very beginning that uh, Johan had the slides about uh, the uh, the bunch of uh, electrophysics data from Nubel and Bezel, and then he said that we will use a bunch of design principles and ODEs and whatnot uh, that Steve likes to talk about to you know say how you know we perceive and all that stuff. So that's kind of what you're seeing from le le levels two, three, four is basically that Hublin weasel and Kufler and Ratline, that machinery that he kind of came across. That's the machinery that he's going to bolt into the system. And then that level five and six is where he's going to tie into the whole, uh, you know, Mondrians and uh, psychophysics and uh, all the perceptual phenomena that uh, psychophysicists and others have studied. So you see that synthesis that he has done here. So it's two, three, four is more from the neurophys world of how to do it. Five, six is coming mostly motivated from the psychophysics uh, and the phenomenological analysis that Steve does. So, yeah. And he'll, he'll treat the, uh, as any modeler should do, you, you put together puzzle pieces that do it, that have been found. You posit puzzle pieces that has, haven't been found. Uh, not enough modelers do this sort of thing. Uh, people are scared to like stick their necks out, necks out sometimes, but Steve has not been scared to do that. And I think it's been vindicated pretty often. <laughs> uh, um, so now to interpret these simulations, 
think of them as like a, just a 1D slice of some of those 2D contrast patterns. And the flow of information is just like in the previous diagram going from bottom to top. So you have the stimulus coming on. Uh, now the, the feature and, and boundary systems are kind of happening simultaneously. Um, and so you can kind of just look at the diagram and see what, this, what the system is doing. But just but to be very clear, the x-axis is the indices of neurons. Uh, time is not being represented here. This is the steady state um, when you present something. So you have a feature representation of could be color or could be just you know gray, gray level for lack of a better term. And then the boundaries are computed. And here's where the big shifts, changes in contrast occur in an unsigned way. And you use them as uh, to fill in uh, the, the feature. So you've kind of, in this particular case, it's like, wait, I just reconstructed what I had to begin with. But <laughs> where it becomes useful is when the illumination becomes more complicated. So this is a version of that idea with uh, the sort of smooth gradient of light. And you can tell what's happened. It's thrown away that whole, uh, that gradation. Uh, and, and the output, once again, is telling you something about the, just the, the ratio of the local ratio between the, the bright part and, it, and its background, more or less. Okay, so this thing on the top, as Grossberg points out, is not veridical when you talk about the energy pattern, but it's useful because it tells you things about where important contours are. So I can look at a few more of these simulations because they're quite, quite good. The, um, so another effect, we didn't talk about it, but it's, you can see it right here. It's called brightness contrast. The, the circles in the middle have the same um, darkness. Yeah, only the, yeah. only the surrounding circles don't. So now imagine that I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a slice through this like a, a 1D kind of uh, slice of this, of this pattern. That's what this represents. So you have dark surrounded by light and then same shade surrounded by much darker. That's what's happening here. Um, you have a feature extraction and a boundary ex extraction. And because the features are sensitive to the direction of contrast, that influences what gets filled in. So if you compare the middle bit here, you see that here, this is, this appears to be darker than this, which is what most people see. They also did 2D simulations, which I really like the, the way these simulations look. <laughs> they, they have this retro kind of quality. Um, so that's the, the, the Craig O'Brien with the boundary. Uh, and you see first the on the, the top, that's the, the boundary uh, the, the, that's being computed. Sorry, the, the lower here, C is the is the boundary. Up is the on top is the feature, and then what you get at that's the, the percept is uh, B and uh, fills in C. So you construct contours within which uniform spreading occurs, and that's what this represents. So the, the the size of the circle represents the degree of activity. I really like the way this is done. Uh, go back to the previous slide. I don't know. I don't know what Kale is asking here. Kale is asking the previous uh, one with the brightness contrast. So, so I think that these two circles should have been just touching to be corresponding exactly with. Oh, the, oh yes. The <laughs> Sorry. I just made it in PowerPoint, <laughs> but yeah, that that's right. Okay. Oh, I, oh, oh, I see. I see. I see. You mean the white, yeah. white small? Yeah, yeah. yeah I didn't, exactly. I didn't perfectly approximate that uh, stimulus. Actually, if you put that, it's not going to change much. Uh, you'll still see that uh, the 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 point of the simul uh, simulation is that the gray value in the left will still yeah. be brighter than the gray value in the in the right. So yeah, so this scallop pattern, as I said in that thing about analysis, gets an analyzed into boundaries which don't care about contrast direction and features which do. And then the features get poured into the, uh, to the things that are delineated by the boundaries, like, like, they're, like they create a bucket. Um, and for the other, um, where there isn't a surrounding border, that's the input. Uh, the feature 
is aware of where the contrast is. There's only this, this single um, boundary there. So there's basically no container. So filling in process happens. It's just that everything runs off. The nice thing about this is it has a, uh, it has an intuitive quality that you can't even see what's happening, that the activity spreads and doesn't have anywhere to stop and just sort of flattens out. So um, Nico brought, brought, brought them up last, uh, last time. So Ken Nakayama and it's Michael Paradis, all right? Um, they uh, looked at this uh, and, and many people had been looking at this type of, of stuff and there were other models out there. And um, they asked, well, how, how does filling in take place? Is it, is it a static, is it a instantaneous uh, or it, is there a spread of activation? Um, and how can we in, uh, create an experiment that, that can tell apart um, how exactly this happens and maybe catch filling in as it's happening. Uh, so if filling in involves spread of activity, maybe we can interrupt the filling in. And uh, they have a very clever type of uh, class of experiments, psychophysic experiments to do this. They present uh, a target where there's a boundary and a, and a central um, image. And here there's no stabilization happening. They're just presenting it normally. And then they have a mask which comes after in a lot of them. Where, uh, so it's some grid, in this case, it's a grid. And then you can ask, well, what, did, what happens to the brightness of, the, 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 of what you saw initially? And you present that again. And uh, so the fundamental result from our experiments is that a mass consisting of contours within the boundaries of a uniform target can have a dramatic effect on the brightness of the interior. So when you present additional contours, you're like, it's, it's like creating little dams uh, that, that will change how, how the uh, flow of the filling in takes place. So with, the, with these alterations, uh, you see quite asymmetric brightness suppression in the vicinity of the of the of the of the masks. So I'll show you what those are. Um, so the target is is always this bright patch, and then if you have a mask which is a line in the middle, what you see is is a little bit of a dip in the brightness in the middle. If you have this C-shaped um, uh, mask, the brightness dips in a way that looks very much like the shadow of the of the of the uh, of the of the mask if you consider the flow of, of filling in happening from the outside it's a few moments to sort of kind of get what what that that flow looks like but imagine that there's a uniform circle coming in from the outside and it hits the 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 boundary what happens at the boundary and there's a circular um, but they, as Grossberg points out, they, they were talking about different models and they found it a little hard conceptually at the very least to imagine um, how the BCS FCS model would work. So they were a little skeptical. And the first problem that they had was about shunting okay. inhibition, first I didn't all, understand I what they meant. Find the BCS FCS model since you can't just pull that out of thin air. Wait, what? You, you need to define the BCS FCS model. You can't just use those acronyms out of. Oh, thing. yeah, I, m I mentioned it a few slides ago. It's a boundary contours and feature contours. No, but um, you didn't use the acronym. Anyway, anyway. And secondly, yeah. I just want to say, as, as a note for anybody who's really interested in this, uh, that Sabine Kastner has come up with some results that really complicate this discussion a lot. Nice. Both psychophysically and um, in terms of uh, monitoring brains of monkey and monkeys and people. Right. So BCS stands for boundary control system and FCS stands for feature control system. It's that diagram that I showed earlier. And so the first objection that they had about shunting inhibition creating sharp percepts, I don't understand the logic, so I, I don't know what to say about it. Uh, the second difficulty uh, was from the feature that diffusion continues until an equilibrium state stage is reached. It isn't obvious how such a process could account for the significant masking observed with the line segment in experiment three. So they say, yeah, but anyway, we should keep an eye on this because the model does explain a lot. But I guess it's just that people don't often have strong intuitions about differential equations. Um, so um, Carl 
Arlington, one of Steve's students, who somehow managed to publish a single author paper on, on, on this topic. Um, uh, he summarized the results and said, let's see, uh, let me use this uh, and look at the time varying aspects of it and introduce some masks. Um, so this is just a summary of, of what the general idea is. You can see time moving inwards and to the left, and you can ask, well, how did the boundary and feature neural activities change? And how did inserting a mask uh, influence the filling in process? He, he also had some really nice uh, figures, um, which I don't know why they're not in Steve's book. <laughs> um, so here he's talking, these are groups of cells that perform filling in. And here is th they're talking about the, the mask that is a, is a line in the middle of the field that comes on after. Um, uh, and you can see that the feature contour system is sensitive to the presence of that. Uh, this is the input coming in. And so that kind of determines, so this, this, this uh, neural activity serves as a wall for the filling in. But these simulation diagrams, again, are really, really good. Um, so he shows a few epochs in the evolution of this uh, set of ODEs, where uh, you initially pr present your circular uh, stimulus and the filling in isn't complete yet. Um, so you, ha you have a boundary and the filling in has begun. Um, and then you present a mask. In this case, there's like a four pieces of a, of a circular mask. And then you can see what happens um, to, the, to the final filling. You can see that you have that shadow effect uh, of, of the masks. So I think more or less an unchanged version of the model uh, was able to, uh, uh, ap to approximate those uh, patterns. And they did several of, of these masks. Okay. So the conclusion, oh. uh, it has been shown that the finding of Paris for Nakayama it's regarded as being against the BCS FCS model, actually support it. So I found a picture of Carl Arrington on LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> that's him. So yeah, he 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 managed to simulate uh, those effects. And and you know whether the model is right or not is a separate matter. But that the model can do this is is I think clearly established. So um, I I well I, I have a few comments to make about this. First of all, is uh, Carl Arrington makes uh, currently is in the business of making quite good eye trackers. Yeah, I, know, I found that. Yeah, around a third of the price of iLink. Um, the 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 second of which is actually came up in my thesis, which Steve made me try to redo my entire thesis in in three months, um, which is whether the boundary equations are multiplicative or additive on the feedback. Right. And if it you if so I started with multiplicative on the feedback, which is what I think Arrington does. And that works way better than being additive on the feedback, which is Steve's more general class of facade models. And I had to try to re-simulate five experiments in three months with additive rather than multiplicative feedback. And it did not fit the data anywhere near as well, but that is what Steve thought was consistent with his previous research. So um, it has to do with whether you think that the top-down feedback on the boundaries is, is a multiple or an addition. Right. So we haven't even, we won't be able to get into the, all the various types of influence but Steve is very well aware that these things don't work in isolation and top-down influence. Yeah, I, I think sorts he's thinking about and, this in terms of you're doing a little part of a, a big right. web. Right. It's and, like um, these are these are modeling Lego blocks, and you know, like Lego blocks, they have little connectors where you know that other other pieces will yeah, fit in quite nicely. Yeah, have to fit. Um, in uh, just if I, I will say that I think Arrington was right on that. Cool. So yeah, uh, already a little bit late. If we, I, I'll just do a little bit of what I have here for anyone who's sticking around because 
because how does it work? We haven't really talked about how it works. We all have now an intuition about what happens, but in the in the details, it's a little it's, it gets a little hairy and complicated, which is why the feature part I haven't even attempted to put in. But let me see how quickly we can go through this. So, simple cells represented here with these, you know, shapes that look like they remind me of the Pokemon balls. These things are sensitive to contrasts of a particular orientation, but they care whether it's light dark or dark light. Um, they compete and cooperate with each other using the same co a competitive cooperative network that we've talked about before um, uh, across locations. So the, like, they're sort of saying, well, do you see that contrast? Do you see that contrast? Like things that uh, cells that are corresponding you know, across hyper columns to a particular orientation are you can think of them as almost like things that are sort of waving around. And this is a very loose metaphor because each of them is a separate cell, but they're all kind of seeing if they can have a handshake to say, we are consistent in our, um, uh, you know, in the contrast or, um, orientation that we see. So those are local contrast uh, detectors. They're not edge detectors because contrast matters. That's stage three over there. Um, and then the complex cells are summing those up uh, in a way that throws away the contrast information. Uh, there's a whole reasoning for that, that the outline of something, like I, when I said about the counter shading in the last time is that, well, the, the background could be changing. So you really want um, uh, boundaries that are invariant to those kinds of con contrast flips. So the complex cells pool similar orientations together. That's just adding basically. Um, and they create amodal orientations where the contrast on either side doesn't matter. And then hypercomplex cells create end stop responses. Again, we've seen this in the data, so it's it's not that um, surprising. Um, and they there's a type of competition that happens here in order to achieve this. So uh, you can't just assume end stop cells. You have to ask, well, how do they show up? And competition across orientations. Uh, will matter that, that this like a, something that's sensitive to to one angle will compete maximally actually with um, an orientation that's 90 degrees with respect to it and, and i just like to mention you know that's that's absolutely key in the um entire co-op in, in the inward completion that we discussed in the last session because this is the dynamic that leads to you can only complete inwardly. Because I, I don't, yeah, like, which which is a whole uh, like I feel like the I used to think that it was the boundary stuff that was super cool, but the feature stuff, in my opinion, is more complicated. So we we'll have to talk about that more later. Um, so there are a couple of different stages of co competition. There's a cross position, same orientation, so that orientations that are same. Uh, across the visual field. If they align, they cooperate. If they don't align, they are inhibiting each other. So that what ends up uh, being contributed by the simple cells is, is a result of that competition. Then you have another um, stage of competition where at the same position, different orientations are competing. Um, it's a little complicated, but all of these pieces are necessary. This is the principle of minimal anatomies uh, at work, which is that there's a lot happening here, but um, all of them play a key role. Uh, so I was just trying to come up with metaphors and because even drawing a diagram of all this stuff is quite difficult. Like drawing a diagram of a, of a hyper column where you have at locations, cells that are sensitive to various orientations and various colors. And then right next to them is another group that does the same thing uh, is, is a lot to, to put to squeeze into a diagram. But I was just thinking of it like this, that you have intra-department politics of cooperation and competition versus inter-departmental cooperation. And both are happening at slightly different levels to do slightly different things. But whatever metaphor you use, this is where things start to get a little baroque in this model and any Steve model. And is where a lot of people start to sort of tune out because it's like, wow, I can't follow along anymore. But I'd like to suggest that even if the models are complicated, when you look at the brain, what would you expect <laughs> if not a whole lot of, you know, interlinked, functionally 
partially explainable, but partially not, not that uh, coherent processes. So I like this term rational reconstruction. There's two senses in which I'd like to use it to describe what Steve is up to. He's rationally uh, reconstructing what a visual system needs to do in order to do kind of an idealized version of capturing contrast features, boundaries, et cetera. In some sense, he's also doing a rational reconstruction of the, psycho of the physiological data, of the EFIS data. He's sort of cleaning them up a little bit and, and kind of making idealized versions of what the EFIS people found. And some of the types of responses like on and then off, and maybe he doesn't use all of them. So you could think of it uh, for all its complexity as still being a kind of schematic um, in some places where there's a hierarchy, it may be much more uh, flat in terms of how these things interact with each other. So that's just something to keep in mind. That it does get complicated, but it's uh, for the type of data that it's trying to, to cover both on the psychophysics side and on the physiology side, it's a lot of is, justification for the complexity. It is better to err on the side of uh, the principle of minimal anatomy than to err on the side of pseudo-biological detail. So <laughs> that is the premise. Uh, you don't want to put in too much to explain anything. Yeah. So um, one interesting set of uh, patterns that uh, helps Steve explain a certain type of interaction are these glass patterns. Not because they look like things that you took a pen, pen and splashed ink on a piece of glass. It's because of somebody named Leon Glass. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's a fun one there. Um, but so basically, you, you take a bunch of randomly distributed dots a piece of paper uh, and you take another copy of it and just rotate it slightly uh, and you see what do you see <laughs> you see contours uh, you see contours that seem to complete in a way so there's a sort of global order that that your visual system is pulled out from this slight orientation and superimposition so that's interesting enough in its in itself but kind of not too hard for steve's model as I already specified to talk about. But there's some subtleties to, to this that Steve's model also treats quite well. The, um, when you do this, the, the, if you flip the, the, the dots for one of the patterns, so turn one from black to white and there's on a gray background, you don't get the, don't get the uh, circular patterns anymore. And here Steve gets to whip out the, the fact that simple cells care about the contrast orientation. So complex cells don't, but where do they get their input from? The simple cells. So simple cells don't have clear orientation patterns to contribute to further parts of the system. Then you won't get those, uh, you won't get the, the input to subsequent uh, stages of the, of, the, of the system that complete boundaries. So, yes, no raw material for boundary completion. We haven't actually talked about the intricacies of how all the boundary completion work. We just sort of started at that. Um, and here's another sort of quirky uh, point that Grossberg makes, that when you have a system like this with these orientation sensitive cells, each of which has some receptive field size, meaning that they, they, they are sensitive to orientations of a certain size in visual angle, then there's a kind of uncertainty principle at work, which is that um, if you take a thin line, the very tip of it at that location in that hyper column, there may be no cells uh, whose orient uh, that file. So basically, when when the rest of the system wants to know what the orientation is at the tip of a line, there's silence from those cells because they, they have they don't have a large enough um, orientation patch to say anything. Um, so Steve calls this um, uh, a, an orientation position uncertainty. We don't actually see this uncertainty because of other um, elements in the model. Um, so these are simulations where the, the lines represent, the length of the line represents the strength of, of an orientation sensor and the orientation is represented by the angle. So these weak lines here show that there's no um, orientation because those corners and, and are not strong enough in size. So the size of the receptive field is this whole thing actually here, the big dotted line. So for a small enough pattern near, near corners and, and ends, there isn't enough input to actually fire any orientation uh, sensitive cell. 
I would I would just like to say that this is this is um, one of the places where I think Steve overthought the situation, and that eye movements get you around this constraint. Ah, that's such a good point. Yeah, you're right. Um, so so yeah, I don't really uh, want to get into this. so so. Uh, I agree with Nico, but I think you'll see that in the later models, we don't have this issue, right? Because precisely because we have included the eye movements, we don't worry about the end cuts anymore. But in these models, up, up to even Passat, because he doesn't include eye movements explicitly, he has no other option. He so, has so yeah, Steve is a victim of a little bit of static thinking, even though these are dynamical. Well, and, I and wouldn't thinking. call it static thinking. No, it's not static thinking. It's just that the, he's assuming the images are static and he's not making any active visual, like, Mm -hmm. yeah. motor movements here in, yeah. in these models explicitly with facade and BCSFCS, he's not going to talk about eye movements explicitly. It's only when you get to anything like art scan is when you start seeing that kind of stuff. And all our art scan models, I don't think we, I don't have any inputs in mind. I didn't have to encounter this at all. Oh, nice. Okay. So yeah, I didn't actually completely understand how NCUTs are done. So I'm just going to skip ahead a little. Oh, well, so, Please. okay. So, so uh, um, I, I would, I would just like to say to the the broader group of people who are watching this or participating in this, that one of one of, in my opinion, the primary fault in Steve's research approach is that he tends to overfit. Given he is so able to do fancy things with the ODEs, that he wants to solve problems with the framework that he has set out, that if he were looking at it from a, you know, 10,000 foot perspective, he would say, it's a feature, not a flaw that my, that this, this particular paper cannot, you know, replicate this data exactly. And they are a little Gibsonian kind of tendency to want to push to get this really exact replication of this data using the framework within the current paper. And so that leads to a general overfitting. I mean, I remember um, this predates both Johan and Karthik, uh, CNS at 15, St St Steve at 65 conference. And, you know, one of the people who was there did a sort of joking pre-presentation that, you know, involved, you know, him, him you know, uh, his version of a weighted linear model circa 1965 and you have you know the set of points and he draws a line that doesn't touch any of them and you know art circa 1965 which manages to draw a curvy line through every single one of them and you know that is that 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 is a serious thing you you have to think about when um you know identifying the the structural flaws and weaknesses in Steve's way of thinking, because it's extremely constructually strong, but it often relies on not, you know, not the best behavioral or other um, data because you read so widely. Yeah. Uh, and it oft, uh, often, uh, you know, it, it tends to, in any given paper, my paper included, overfitting um, results. Cool. So that actually relates to exactly what I wrote in that third point there, which is to the extent that the model is accurate, it has to deal with the issues. But some of the issues that Steve is solving are consequences of other stages of the model. And like you said, even if those are issues for a, a robot that, that lives in the way that these models do, it may not be an issue for an animal that is looking around, moving around, moving its head, etc. So that's always something to keep in mind. Um, <laughs> so this is related to this point that who cares about all this? Well, Steve derives all these model derived counterfactuals, one of which maybe we'll talk about next time because it's more to do with features. But if you don't have a, a well sort of capped uh, line, the feature, because the line has a thickness, that feature can actually spread in all directions. Uh, uh, so some of the illusions actually make use of some of these uh, possibilities. But we'll maybe talk about that later. Um, okay, yeah, so that's all I really had for today. And, and I have, I could show you a little bit more of, of Yarbus's setup. In fact, this, this line endings, uh, leaky, sneaky stuff is very important for explaining that Kafka Benuzi ring. 
So right, yeah. you don't have this sort of line endings there. You will not see the first step. And it's a pretty complicated uh, illusion. Uh, it's not a, it's not even as simple as like, you know, take a grind concert and all that stuff. So you need that line ending to be, you know, sealed. For, for right. So, so I, 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 I read it. I don't really want to get in. Understand what's happening. One of us should reach out to Gennady and get him to do like twenty minutes. Sure. Yeah. Forbidden uh, colors and violating neon color spreading, and I mean, because he's the person who did all those experiments. So, so yeah, we, we make, depending on what we feel like, we can dive into the feature stuff. Or I think we on... should, you know, do a primary. Um, you know, seminar series, and then dive into all the eccentricities that came right. up through discussion. Yeah, after, yeah. Which is what I yeah. think is probably better. But yeah. you know, so let's like, just move on. on this type of thing. You know, Gennady knows more than me and Karthik. You know, with two years reading literature put together. Right. Well, I'm. I think that it might make sense to just move on to the next one, where he's talking about attention and memory and. So, uh, you know, uh, a change. Uh, no, no, so I would prefer to go through the book and then we have a big list of, you know. Uh, yeah, yeah. Footnotes because anyway, we have to talk about vision again that. later. Um, I don't know what everybody else, especially the people who are not, uh, yeah. you know, who have not had Steve as an advisor think about this. Yeah. As Nancy Capel likes to say, onward. Good, good, good. So we will, we will move along and to... Then, and then backward once you're sufficiently confused. <laughs> well, we, we're going to do a feed forward sweep and then, then yeah. whoever survives the feed forward sweep will get to do the, 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 the top down sweep. <laughs> That's definitely um, very good. Uh, yeah. You know, we so, definitely need to, you know, invite Gennady and both Arash's. Arash, and, yeah, yeah. And, uh, uh, Luis Pizzoa, um, you know, there's a whole bunch of people yeah, we need yeah. to invite to. And I think. Of, and I think the intuition about what the feature system is doing is the key. Like the, the, the quirks of the details, maybe we can leave for now because these other ideas about, about you know. But, you know, as, as, uh, Rush, as Rushi Bhatt, you know, pointed out, you know, his model only works in the details. It does not work as a global model. Okay. Like if you vary the contrast of his stimuli by 0.1%, the whole model breaks. Oh yikes! This is the thing that that this always worries me. About modeling it. in the details, extremely and, sensitive you know, models. Like I, I think I think it's important to understand that when we humans try to implement Steve models with only our input and output sources of our brains, rather the than the entire you know computational uh, ability of it, um, you know we have to make compromises, just like with computers. Yeah, it's the uh, GSD, right? Graduate student tra training by graduate student descent. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to show you guys Yarbus's apparatus, and also look at him humble bragging over here. He's like, other people have tried to do image stabilization studies, and they didn't get really good cancellation or, or of the image. And he's like, well, imperfections of their technique, which <laughs> he shows you over the course of chapter one how he sets up uh, his his method, which is just a tour de force. Uh, experimental tour de force. Um, so there's this, the eyelids are secured and they place this little suction cup thing and they have <laughs> they have this thing to protect the face and then they yeah, pull the eyelid open. They're all short experiments and he assures the reader that they didn't bother the subject too much. But yeah, it's really, really elaborate. And so yeah, they had this stuff to fix the head and the chin and you shed light from various sources, uh, prisms to show uh, things. That are way, we, still, we still fix the head and chin like this. It's not very yeah. different. So. Um, but yeah, pre pretty elaborate. And I love this bit. So as a rule, the duration of experiments with the cap should not exceed five minutes. And only in rare cases, as long as 10 to 12. Drying of the cornea, especially its central part, is accompanied by a sharp fall in the resolving power of the eye and is always regarded by the subject with some alarm. <laughs> <laughs> in such cases, the experiment must be stopped. Cornea, cornea usually resumes its previous form after a few minutes. And then later on, he says that if, this ha if the irritation is sooner, then the subject is not a suitable subject. <laughs> Let's go and blame Sorry. the subject. 
So yeah, I'm like, maybe did Stanley Kubrick read this book and add the eyedropper? <laughs> <laughs> Got to keep the eyes moist. <laughs> I think that there is no question that Stanley Kubrick knew Jarvis's experiments. Oh. There are many reasons other than this clip. I mean, it's just the way he uses focal attention. I mean, there's no way he didn't look at Jarvis's work. I think that the, the, the scan path image of uh, the, the, the famous Jarvis scan path image uh, was on the cover of like science or something, like some very big magazine. So it was like science or scientific American or something like that. that. That was like a major cover that people were able to like readily access. So it's quite possible that Kubrick who was like looking at technologies around that time might have just bumped onto this and like, it was like oh, I'm going to put that in my. Cool. I'll stop the recording now and, and maybe I can pull up that image if anyone wants to see it. <laughs> 